First of all, it's an honor and privilege to be here today. I want to thank Ken and, and Bruce and Chris for the invitation to participate. It's, it's a lively, going to be a lively day, and I appreciate the opportunity. We're going to be talking about investing in global equity markets. I will give you a 30-second spiel on McKinley Capital. We are in Anchorage, Alaska. I read I'd in a couple of days ago from Anchorage. Um, we are li located in Anchorage, Alaska because we are equal distance from New York, Tokyo, and London. And we're a firm that's 86% global and non-US stock-based firm and 97% long-only equity and models. So we are an equity firm located in Anchorage. We're interested in global stocks and in Chinese stocks. And I'll tell you why China is so exciting for it at least for me and for us, and that is we believe that there's always opportunity with IRs and sharp ratios, uh, to, and we also find that there's a great deal of volatility in this market, and if you love volatility and if you love high sharp ratios and high information ratios, China is an exciting market. You will not see a more volatile market than China. It makes EM seem like it's almost large cap. So I think you're going to have an interesting time as we look at the Chinese market. So with that, I want to say that the work that we're presenting today is really joint in nature. Sajit Ding is my primary co-author. Sajit Ding teaches in the computational finance program, the QCF program at Georgia Tech. At McKinley, I have a master's from Georgia Tech, as, as Chris told you. And when I get ready to recruit, I tend to make a trip to Atlanta. We give a, a seminar in Atlanta every year with Axioma, McKinley, and Georgia Tech, and that's where I primarily do my recruiting base. Harry Markowitz and Gan Lin Shu are my old colleagues from Daiwa days. Gan Lin Shu is a PhD in, in um, math from Carnegie Mellon. He, he and Harry work on our scientific advisory board four hours a month, but I would much rather have Harry Markowitz for four hours a month than many people for 100 hours a week. Um, Rob Gillum, our CIO, and Elaine Wang are contributed to our research as well. Sujit Ding is a very bright person, and he's a delightful co-author. He also helped me get a teaching gig at the, at the uh, Shanghai University School of International Business and Economics, and that's one of the main reasons that I'm so excited about China is when you get to go to Shanghai, you see a city that's three times the size of New York, and it's a very exciting place to be. Now, I want to start off, and we're going to be talking about research in threes today, and we're going to give you our research conclusions in advance. First of all, the reason that we're 86% global and non-US is we find that's where our methodology works, works best. Our models tend to do extremely well in global, non-US, and emerging markets. We're going to show you different types of optimization as well. Harry Markowitz is on our scientific advisory board for two reasons. Number one, Harry Markowitz is brilliant. And number two, 60 years after the development of mean variance optimization, Harry Markowitz's models are extremely difficult to beat. They are great benchmarks. And for all, you know, you always go off to conferences and they always say, well, is Harry Markowitz and and Bill Sharp, sometimes some books like The Misbehavior of Financial Markets refer to those people as quote unquote dinosaurs. Um, we don't believe that at McKinley. We don't believe that for a moment. And the person that said that was, you know, is no longer with us. So I think the Lord interacted on that behalf. <laughs> having said that, having said that, we believe that the benchmark for Markowitz analysis is extremely difficult to beat. Now, we're going to show you two types of models, and I learned to do this with Harry 25 years ago. We are going to show you proprietary models, and we're going to show you public models, and 95% of our comments will be on the public models today. We will share everything about our public models. We will tell you a little bit about our proprietary models, but we believe that everything we will tell you in our public model today, the exposures and the risk behaviors, are, will be the same with our public model and our proprietary model. Our, we have two sources of model building at McKinley. We tend to believe in forecasted earnings, acceleration, and price momentum. Our primary source of alpha, our primary source of stock selection is our forecasted earnings acceleration model. It works extremely well in global and non-US markets, does very well in EM. 
works in the Russell 3000, is actually starting to work in Japan as well. Japan, for most of you that know that, know that market, know that Japan was written you know, by Graham and Dodd. Their methodology continues to rule supreme in Japan 70 years later. Um, we'll show you some Japanese results. We're going to pass the data mining, the Markowitz shoe data mining test. We've always done these at McKinley. So our research conclusions are the following. Our models will work. Our models alpha is driven primarily by stock price appreciation. We will capture the momentum risk exposure in our global and in our non-US markets, which is far greater than the risk, the factor return in the US market for momentum. And we want to pass the Markowitz shoe data mining test. So those are our three results. Is our, is our analysis consistent with previous literature? One of the questions we're going to ask, we're also going to look at the role of forecasted earnings, and we're going to look at how models can be implemented. One thing I want to tell you, and I want to make this distinction known right now, our work at McKinley is applied investment research. When I worked for Harriet Dial, we would, we would go out and answer all types of questions. We don't answer those, those broad-based questions at McKinley. We are not the traditional deep thought thinkers that you would have with the Harry Markowitz. We're not even trying to work in those realms. What we're interested in is work that can be implemented into client portfolios to enhance returns. We are big believers in the IBIS database. Now, when you see our earnings forecasting work, you're going to see a paper cited Block, Gerard, Markowitz, Todd, and Shue from 1993. In 1991, Harry, of course, won the Nobel Prize, shared it with Bill Sharp, Merton Miller. Um, we want, at that time, our good friend Joshua Leibniz, who's in the audience today, Joshua helped coordinate a conference between Daiwa and NYU. We presented papers. Those, that paper is online at SSRN, so as we make our presentation today, we want to alert you to the fact that the Japan and the World Economy paper, my paper with Harry from the International Journal of Forecasting, the IJF, the 2015 paper, is online, and the paper that we will present today is online at SSRN. We believe in earnings forecasting. Why? Because it's our primary source of alpha. We believe that, that you can enhance models using the IBIS database. I want to cite two, two, mention three names in particular. The IBIS database, as you all know, was developed by Elton, Gruber, and Goltigan. We continue to work with, Mart, with uh, Marty Gruber. Marty Gruber is always a great asset for us. We love to, to go out to dinner with him and try to pick his mind. Mustafa Gultikin is a co-author, um, a very infrequent co-author, but a co-author, needless to say, nevertheless. And um, Lang Wheeler is a name that many of you may or may not be aware of. Lang Wheeler, of course, founded Numeric. And for those of you that heard John Bogle at the Q Group meeting, and he was talking about the inconsequential nature of active management at the Q Group, it was quite an interesting talk. His son was... Uh, Lang's partner at Numeric Investors, so we, we refer you to that. You're going to see that Sijit Ding is mentioned in our previous literature. The IJF is an Elsevier journal. I serve on their editorial board. I'm the only practitioner that's been on their board. Um, I've been there since 1991, and a couple of issues ago, we had a contest where we talked about earnings forecasting, and we had what we affectionately refer to as McKinley is the horse race. We build a set of expected returns. We send them out to our research vendors, such as, at that time, Axioma, APT, Bloomberg, and they build portfolios and send to us, and we report the results, and we look to see what are the best risk models that are available for commercial use. Now, if I had to summarize McKinley and our research approach, I would summarize it in this set of almost a pseudo flowchart, this graph. This is borrowed liberally from a paper that Harry and I wrote from the Japan and World Economy in 1993. This is an updated flowchart. We're going to take expected returns, whether it's from our McKinley Quant model, MQ, or whether it's from our public model. The US public model is user, US expected returns, global expected returns for the global model. We're going to have those as inputs to a Markowitz portfolio optimization system. So you should think of it that the world revolves around Markowitz. That's, no, that's, it's a nice line, though. But that is 
clearly the key to our process. We believe in portfolio optimization. Our inputs are expected returns. We use APT and axioma risk models. We test statistical fun versus fundamental models. We do have a bias. We believe in statistical risk models. And we use portfolio constraints. We have turnover constraints. And then we have different sets of weights, whether we're using equal active weighting risk or mean variance risk or mean variance tracking error. It, it risk models, we, for risk, we, we have different weights that we use in portfolio construction. We produce an efficient frontier. We believe in the efficient frontier, and we're going to take points off that efficient frontier. We will use those for our data mining corrections test, and we will use those in our attribution analysis. So we're going to pick a spot and show you how these portfolios do. Now, in 1993, we had a public model at Daiwa. Earnings, book value, cash flow, and sales, good old-fashioned Graham and Dodd measures of what some people would call value. We also take these ratios and look at them relative to their 60-month averages. When I worked for Harry, we used to do back tests. And in our Japan and World Economy paper, we had 270 back tests that we published. Why? Because at, that, at the beginning of 1991, Harry was starting a research department at Daiwa. It was a great experience because what you did was you had a completely blank canvas. And Harry says, let's build great stock selection models. There is nothing better than that. It, this is like nirvana. You get there, there are no biases. There's, let's just let the data lead us to where we want to go. So we wor worked at these models. We, we're going to show you five-year models, whether you have your relatives for two years, three years, five years. They all test out about the same. So we continue to use five-year models. When I moved to McKinley, we are a global growth specialist. And as a global growth specialist, what we took was for our public model, we have our original eight-factor model, as we did with Markowitz, but we put in a forecasted earnings acceleration variable that we call CTEF. We pu I published a paper on CTEF in 1997 with Mustafa and Bernal Stone, co-authors that I've, that I've worked with since days in the mid-'80s when I was working on some research for the Q Group. We had a Q Group grant, and we, we started to develop a lot of our earnings forecasting work the mid-80s, it continues to be strong. You know, you always hear, does academic research destroy, do academic publications destroy the predictive power of models? I guess our paper's not cited enough to destroy its predictive power. But it, it does extremely well. We also have price momentum. And with our price momentum variable, you know, people talk about 12-1, 7-1, 6-1. There are variations. If you want variations on it, you know, we refer you to Jennifer Conrad's work at Chapel Hill. And um, we, we're going to be showing you 12-1 in most of our analysis today. Now, I believe that when you deal with financial data, you have two problems. And we have these problems that have always existed. We, ran these, we had these problems in 1993. We continue to have these problems. We have the problem of outliers. We believe that robust regression is necessary. We, would ex we all know that there should be 5% of the observations should be, you know, within, you know, 5% of the observations should be outside a 95% confidence interval. We're going to find about 8%. Now, when I worked for Harry Markowitz 25 years ago, Harry says, no, John, we all learned about Gauss-Markov, and we all know that the linear, you know, blue, we all know that the best linear unbiased estimator, you're telling me that Gauss and Markov were wrong. We're, no, we're not telling you Gauss and Markov were wrong. We're telling you that they're problems of outliers that Edgeworth talked about in 1880. And we continue to, to look at different approximations. I made a presentation at the University of Washington because Doug Martin is a, is a really outstanding researcher in their, at their computational program, they, their computational finance program. And he was one of John Tukey's PhD students at Princeton in electrical engineering. And when I made my presentation, I said we were using the beaten Tukey by square procedure. Doug Martin says, gee, John, that's really nice. But you know, if you pick up my 2006 John Wiley book, you're going to see that we've talked about the Tukey optimal influence functions. And you know, you need to update your slides and update some of your research. And I said, yes, sir. And we did that. And what we will show you is that J Doug Martin was exactly right. The Beaton-Tukey procedure is highly statistically significant, 
and the Tukey optimal influence is even a little better. Yes, moving the needle in tweaks as we refer to them. The second problem of data is multicollinearity. Now, we believe in using latent root regression, which is looking at the principal components of matrices and looking at which variables are statistically significant. We eliminate those with non-predictive near singularities. In other words, latent roots less than 0.3, the latent vectors less than 0.10, and we find that those models do better. We refer you to the 1993 paper where Harry made us test every possible permutation known to man. We continue to find those results are important. Now, research in threes. We're going to show you three levels of model testing. We're going to show you three methods of Markowitz optimization. We're going to sh show you results from three testing universes. And we're going to have three research conclusions that we've already told you about. All right, levels of testing. Almost everybody on Wall Street shows you information coefficients, ICs. We all learned that from Jim Farrell in his book, Portfolio Theory. We believe in ICs. We test them. Now, the problem with the ICs, as we all know, is that, you know, a rising water lifts all boats, and, you know, if the market does well, then you can do well. And so level one is interesting, but we spend most of our time on level two, markets efficient frontiers with transactions costs. We believe in efficient frontiers as God is my witness, which is what we always say in Atlanta. As God is my witness, we believe that everything has to do with the markets efficient frontiers. Uh, we're going to show you more efficient frontiers today than you'll care to see. And then we do the data mining corrections test, the data test number three. For those of you, and Harry published his paper in 1994. Harry's paper should be more cited than it is um, in the Journal of Portfolio Management. It is a difficult paper to read. It is a very difficult paper to read. All right, our three different types of optimization. We always refer to mean variance optimization using total risk as mean variance M59. Why M59? That's off the Markowitz book. This is exactly what chapters 6 and 7 of the 1959 book are. All right. Mean variance tracking error at risk, MVTAR. Think about a cocktail. Think about the fact that if you wanted to have a risk model, it could be total risk, it could be systematic risk. With mean variance tracking error at risk, the way we do it, we define it as three parts systematic factors, two parts unsystematic factors. So we have five parts to our cocktail. And it's primarily systematic risk. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to minimize the underperformance of a benchmark. We also will test equal active weighting. Equal active weighting is something that Harry came up with in 1987. It's in his 1987 book on mean variance choice in financial markets, and he talked about optimization within plus or minus bounds. We usually use plus or minus 2% optimization bound. When I, was, when I was at Duke, I went over to take a course from a gentleman at Chapel Hill, Henry Latney. So I took Latney's portfolio theory class. I was the youngest person by about 10 years in the class. And um, I believe that in the long run, we always maximize the geometric mean. When they ding the bell, and the Lord calls us all home, if we maximize the geometric mean, we will maximize the utility of final wealth. That's all we want. So we, we recognize the work of Henry Latney. We also recognize the fact that Harry Markowitz talked about this in chapters 5, investment for the long run, and in chapter 12. And we're also going to maximize the Sharpe ratio. Our three universes, at McKinley, we are big fact set users. And so what we try to do is we build broad investment universes. We pull down data from fact set with sales and income that are complete. We're, our initial data was 1982 to 2011. We took the top 7,500 stocks in terms of market cap. Our second universe are MSCI index constituents. Many people use index constituents I'm not going to comment on MSCI. Um, and our, our third universe is going to have to do with updated universe that has to do with China in particular. And we are, we're going to compare Chinese stocks and global stocks. We're also going to take it to December of 2015. When I was in China teaching my class last year in May, the Chinese market was up 
substantially. It was up over 100% at that time. By the time the year ended, it had, of course, had given back considerably, but we're also going to show you that our Chinese market, our model did extremely well in China last year. So those are our three universes. Universe one, the facts at universe top 7,500. These charts are from our paper from the, Internet, from the International Journal of Forecasting, my paper with Harry and Gan Lin. All we want to show you are three different approaches. And I want to talk about a lambda of 200. This is from the APT system. And John Blinn and Steve Bender are very good friends. They did sell their company. SunGuard now owns them. But let's look at this, lambda of 200. All right, we find that this is a global universe. Top 7,500 stocks, if we have a lambda 200, we have a geometric mean of around 16.67%. We have a sharp ratio of 0.61. We have an IR of 0.65. And we have a substantial tracking error. Substantial tracking error. For, if you're an index hugger, we are always taught to say our best, some of our best friends are index huggers. We don't like index huggers. We don't. I don't even want to look at them or drink with them if I can possibly avoid it. Markowitz MV59, a very aggressive portfolio. Let's look at MV TAR. Notice the lambda of 200 gives us a higher information ratio of 0.97. So what we're showing you is that the Markowitz portfolio geometric mean of 16.37 in the olden days falls to 16.09 with the with the newer technology, but the information ratio is higher because the tracking error is less. So if you want to maximize tracking errors, yes, mean variance tracking error at risk is a, is a very good system for controlling risk. The sharp ratio rises, the information ratio rises. My boss, Rob Gillum, our CIO, believes in equal active weighting optimization within plus or minus 2% bounds. And if you do that, notice your returns go down, but your, your uh, tracking error is, is low. To be honest with you, if I have to, if I'm going to put my last dollar on a portfolio, it's hard to beat mean variance tracking error at risk, and there's very little difference between that and Markowitz's 1959 piece. 60 years after the fact, Markowitz still has a great system. We're going to show you a back test. Now, Bill Sharp's going to be sitting there laughing, and she's going to say, Nobody ever showed you a back test that lost. And that's true. We're going to show you a long run back test. <clears throat> Pardon me. This is from a back test from 1999 to 2011. It does have statistically significant active returns. It has, to, it has an IR of 1.2. Now, of its active return, about two thirds of that is based on factor contributions. What is our most important factor? It is medium term momentum. We are a global growth shop that believes in momentum. You're going to see the T value on momentum is 8.10 in a global setting. Our, our exposure is about 0.45. We make our money, you notice specific return, 5.13%. It is statistically significant. We believe in three things at McKinley. We believe that we make money on our specific return, which has to do with our forecast earnings acceleration. We want to earn our, our medium-term momentum return, which, are, which is a risk factor return. This is, of course, from the Axioma system, APT portfolio created, but Axioma derived. And this is our public model, our 10-factor model. And we believe that active returns can be positive and statistically significant. Now, I will say this. In the olden days, when I worked with Harry, we were always very proud of the fact that we were a pure black box quant shop. And when we had a back test, and we put our real-time performance on it, they lay on top of each other. It was really unbelievable. We're getting better about that at McKinley now. We're getting better about that. But we believe that in the long run, you sit there and you have to, you know that a quant model should win in either seven or eight out of 10 years. And Harry Markowitz had a great line in 1993 when we were launching the Japan Equity Fund. And he says, you know what, he, it was, he was interviewed at Heard on the Street, and Harry says, you know what, our model's working 82% of the years. And if you are not comfortable with winning in 82% of the time, please go to another asset manager, because you're never going to be happy. 
You're never going to be anyone that we could please. And your, reason, your expectations are absurd. A great line. We use the axioma risk model a lot. We're, we're big believers in the axioma system. This is from our IJF paper. We're going to show you two of sets of efficient frontiers. One has fundamental models, one has statistical models. If I want to maximize the IRs, where am I going to go? I'm going to go with the statistical model. If I want to maximize the Sharpe ratios, I go with the statistical model. If I want to maximize the geometric means, I go with the statistical model. Would I ever use a fundamental model? Yes, if a client says, what, are my, what am I loading up on? And, and do I have a way of betting on any of those factor exposures? And so we're going to show you that deep down inside, fundamental models are good, statistical models are better. That was universe one. Universe two, MSCI index constituents. For those of you that believe in MSCI index constituents, we show you this. It's hard to rally around a T statistic. That's what Woody Hayes told us. It was very hard to rally around a math class. But we're going to show you the T statistics. We pass our traditional T statistics from the point of view of our models. We're going to show you some benchmarks here. I believe that one of the great benchmarks in finance is the, the high EP or the low PE approach. It's a great benchmark. It's been around for 70 years. We're, we will use it in almost all of our publications from the point of view of a benchmark. We're going to show you MQ, our McKinley proprietary model, and we're going to show you our public model. The, the private model does have a higher IC. We're also going to show you the old-fashioned Markowitz eight-factor model, and it's continued to be statistically significant. We're showing you different universes. Now, EM is emerging markets, JP is Japan, China, and a global market. One thing about global markets, we, we break down our global markets into two groups. One is an overall top 7,500 stock market. The other one is a market where there are at least two IBIS analysts. Why two IBIS analysts? Very important. At McKinley, if we pull down data every week, which we do on Wednesday, we have approximately 43,455 stocks that we could invest in. If we require IBIS forecasts, our IBIS investable universe is 16,670 stocks. And if we look at, if we restrict ourselves to at least two analyst coverage, which we do because we're trying to get a standard deviation with two on a standard deviation on our analysts. If we have two analysts IBIS coverage, we can always get a third analyst from, from another source. But our two analysts IBIS takes our universe from 16,670 to approximately 12,262. So we have approximately 12,000 stocks that we follow every week that we pull down data from. The optimization we're going to talk about, we're going to assume 8% monthly turnover. So 8% buys, 8% sales. We're going to have a 4% maximum position. This is mean variance as in Markowitz 1959, 35 basis point threshold, 150 basis points of transactions across each way. Now, the first thing we want, the first thing you're going to say is, my God, 150 basis points of transactions cost. Look, many of us, when we, when we sit there, we say, well, what are transactions cost? We'll show you that ITG estimates our transactions cost to be about 45 basis points. We're going to be using analysis now that is going to be both axioma and APT related. Now, I could go through all these slides, but these slides would be boring. I know that, and I'm, so I'm not going to do that. But I do want to show you our trade-off curves, what they would look like for a global optimization, both from the point of view of our proprietary model and CTEF, our forecasted earnings acceleration model. If you look, the returns on CTEF are much better than the returns on alpha. Yes. This is why we have predictive power from our um, forecasted earnings acceleration model. We, we have this for global. We have it for, again, our index constituents only global model, which is uh, you know, about one third the size of the other model. Same results. We have the same results. For the, for, for the non-US form of our models. And this is very important because our, 
most of our assets are in our non-US. And again, you see CTF is better than alpha. And the Markowitz regression systems, the eight-factor model, actually hold up surprisingly well. Particularly in emerging markets, well, pardon me. We want to go first to uh, Japan. If you look at 25 years after publication, our Markowitz model does extremely well in Japan. It, do, it does extremely well in Japan. And um, it's something we're very proud of. The model has maintained its predictive power. Notice in China, everybody thinks that China is a bubble economy. It's not. It is not a bubble economy. It is basically a Graham and Dodd system, very much like Japan. China works very much like Japan. The eight-factor model does well. The ten-factor model does better. So having said that, let me go to an executive summary slide. So rather than show you every universe and go through every possible permutation, which would be, we would have to be waking people up and saying, for God's sake, John, enough. Um, what we want to show you is our, our executive summary. The MQ model works extremely well in the global setting, in the non-US setting, and in emerging markets. That is 90% of our AUM. Yes, we have a US model. Yes, we have a Japanese model. From the point of view of, so we're going to show you total active equity, which remain, means we've removed transactions costs. We're also going to show you the specific returns from the BARA system. We want these to be statistically significant. This is our stock selection model. If you notice this, this chart, what you're going to see is the GLER model, our public model, has positive and statistically significant active returns and specific returns in the vast majority of the universes. Okay. Our CTEF factor, our forecast earnings acceleration, gives us the vast majority of our specific returns of our GLER model. That's why we said that our GLER model is where we have specific returns. We want to capture the price momentum benefits of alpha, which is a risk exposure. And an optimization where we look at using an attribution analysis we talk about we want to have specific asset selection that's statistically significant, 4.44 with a T-value of 4.57. Total active risk, total active return, 14%, 5% tracking, 5% uh, T-value, 5, 5 T-value rather, 4.98. Now, this is for the Markowitz system from 1959. If you use the Markowitz system, on the GLER, our public model, you see that it's, it's actually higher and it, it works well. So we believe, number one, in um, our forecasted earnings acceleration model, which is 4.44 for asset, asset selection, and our public model is 5.90, so that's 5.96. So that's about 80% coming in from our forecasted earnings acceleration model. As we look to the future and, and how we're going to build our models, we're always going to continue to come back to our data mining test. So this is the Markowitz Shoe data mining test from 1994 in the Journal of Portfolio Management. We want to pass our test. We want our betas. In 1993, our beta for our, our Jap Japanese model was 0.5944, our data mining correction factor, which meant that 60% of our excess returns should be continued into the future. And notice that for Japan, it's 44%. For global models, it's around 40%. These are statistically significant with our data mining corrections factor test. Notice the model where we have the least predictive power in the future is emerging markets. That should not be surprising to you. We do pass the test, but it's, it's a marginal pass. Third universe, global universe. Now we're going to take it up to December of 2015. We're going to show you global and China. We have 41 models that we're now using in our data mining corrections test. Suffice it to say that GLER and MQ are almost indistinguishable. Our public model and our private model are virtually indistinguishable in the global setting. Notice our, our CTEF, which is our public model, published in 1997, and our E prime model, which is our proprietary model, are virtually indistinguishable. So those drive our system. And we have 41 factors that we test. When we were building models for testing, you know, people say, well, how do you get your models for testing? 
we're big believers in, you know, looking at a, va a vast majority of, a vast array, pardon me, of models that we could test. We really like the work of Savita Subramaniam at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. She has most of these variables in the U.S. that she presents to us on a quarterly basis. So we're big Savita fans. As we look to China A shares, which are exciting, what do we see? Forecasted earnings acceleration and our public model do extremely well in China. But notice this. Notice the standard deviation. If you're not excited about this, there is something fundamentally wrong with you, with all due respect. Look at the standard deviations, 30% a year. Holy cow. This is not for your closet indexers. This is not a closet indexer model. This is a wonderful model market for building quant models. There's nothing better than this. This is absolutely outstanding. We're, we're still wanting to maximize our geometric mean. We're still wanting to maximize our sharp ratios and our IRs. And um, we're ranking our models according to our IRs. Notice the tracking errors. Yeah, they're substantial. Grow up. And the benchmark, 12.5%. So we, we believe that we can make excess returns. Our research conclusions, we believe that we can produce statistically significant models, primarily in global, non-US, and emerging markets using the three optimization techniques that we've showed you, Markowitz mean variance, Markowitz tracking error at risk, and equal active weighting. Our E-prime model, our forecasted earnings acceleration, is our primary source of excess returns from alpha. And we can pass all the mining. Our data mining tests, we pass them all except the China A shares. Why? Too short a history. About 20 years ago, when Harry was working on his data mining test, Gan Lin and I tried to re-engineer it. We said, we're going to cheat. And we're going to ask ourselves the following question. How much data is necessary? So we went to the University of Chicago CRISP meeting in 1994 and gave a, a, a seminar paper on re-engineering Markowitz's model to say how many years were necessary, primarily seven years of data were necessary. Harry says, you know, we really don't like your re-engineering our process, but we wanted to ask ourselves the question, taking a set of models, how many years are necessary, seven. Now, we're going to show you some supplemental analysis. What's, what, what do we believe is important? Um, and I'm going to be wrapping up in the next five minutes. I have a co-author at Chapel Hill, Mustafa Goltikin. Great guy. Great guy. And so we've, we've been pulling down data and running axioma statistical models. And we find, once again, that the statistical model beats the fundamental model, as you see in this chart. We also will say, you know, we have a marketing group. And if we showed, we had shown you before a chart that had 200 port stocks in our portfolio. We're a concentrated manager. We only have 70 stocks in most of our portfolios. And so if I showed you a 200 stock thing and did not comment on the number of names, our marketing department would say, my God, you're giving the impression that we're no longer concentrated. Yes, we're concentrated. We put name constraints on there, and we still do well. You're, we are big believers in the axioma alpha alignment factor, the AAF system, when we believe it has tremendous ability to, to uh, push out the efficient frontier. We gave this paper in Atlanta. We worked with Henri Saxena. We've worked with Rob Stubbs at Axioma. We believe that there's tremendous opportunities there. With the McKinley horse race, we also shipped them the data, and they verified all of our calculations. There's always a question of how many factors do you need. Mustafa, Burnell, Stone, and I used four factors in our model in 1997. This is post-publication. We're looking now from 1999 to 2014. Four factors dominates one factor, and the 15 factors of the statistical model at, at Axioma are are preferred to the four-factor model. As I told you when we looked, when I made this presentation at the University of Washington with my weighted latent root regression, we had specific returns of 8.51, a T value of 5. Doug Martin says, John, 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 that's 1974. Let's move into the correct century. Into the correct century. That was hurtful. All right. We went to Tukey optimal influence function. And we go from 8.51 to 10.24. Yeehaw. An improvement. It is, Doug. You're correct. Our T value goes up to 6.46.
Doug Martin was exactly right. We're doing some joint research with Doug Martin right now. He's one of the brightest people you'll ever meet. Just retired from the University of Washington. I think he's about 78. Um, but he's, he's a really smart guy, and we, we like to do research with him. Um, last thing we want to show you, you know, Campbell Harvey, when he published his, when, well, when Campbell Harvey made, makes his presentations on data mining, he shows the BHY test, and he's correct. He didn't cite Harry's paper in 1994, shame on Campbell. Harry wrote him a nice note and said, you know, Campbell, you're a very bright guy, but perhaps you should do a little bit more in literature review. We will show you with the BHY testing. This is from a paper that Harry and I published in the IBM Journal of Research and Development. They had a special issue on smarter finance, because who wants to publish in an issue called dumber finance? So we, we, um, we had this paper with the IBM Journal, and we took our data mining test. We used Campbell Harvey's procedure, and we had virtually identical haircuts. And so we believe that Ham Campbell's study from, it, it may be published by now, but his paper that he was giving about a year and a half ago, we find the same results as we did with, when we used the Markowitz shoe data mining corrections factor. So it's all, it's all the same world. I thank you very much. So a question for, for John as well. Um, the, um, in, in, even the U.S., right, it's not like you're very much uh, using the IBIS database. One of the biggest challenges in the U.S. for the last 10, 15 years is the whole gap versus pro forma. Uh, did you run into similar issues, or is that an issue uh, with, the, uh, with the Chinese stocks? No, surprisingly, we didn't make any data adjustments for, for China. We, we were just able to use the IBIS exactly as IBIS is. We didn't have any problems with accounting standards or anything else. We just use data as it is. It's kind of interesting because, you know, when, when I worked for Harry, everybody was concerned about accounting standards in Japan 25 years ago. And we simply used the data as reported and had no issues. So we, we don't believe that accounting standards have any relevance in the world. No, I probably shouldn't say that, but we don't. We, we have no use for accountants, with all due respect. Other questions? Did you consider adding asset growth effect and the quality effect in your expected return uh, proxy? Because they are like highly relevant proxy, at least in the US stock market. And the asset growth effect is also uh, proven, at least in academic works, that it uh, exists internationally. So it may also improve your expected return proxy and also maybe give you some better results. You know, th there are many variables we, we could have used. We, we have not used asset growth. Now, many, many people will know that if, you're, if you use a risk model, such as BARA or Axioma, they have growth factors of which historic a asset growth and sales growth are often part of those risk models. So those are part of risk premiums. But we haven't specifically looked at that with respect to our to our alpha model generation process. I do want to say one word about the alpha process additionally. You know, we, I did not, I, I tried to be very clear the difference between proprietary and, and, and uh, public model. One thing that's important about the, the momentum model that I want to reemphasize, when we talk about forecasted earnings acceleration, we talk about earnings momentum, people often confuse earnings momentum and price momentum and believe they're the same. We want to tell you right now that we believe that our earnings momentum and price momentum ca correlation coefficients are 0.3 or less in most universes. So we're talking about very different variables. So our price momentum is very different than our earnings momentum. And they complement each other nicely, which is why the models do what they do. With respect to asset growth, is something that, that we could and should look at in the future. Thank you.